So thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Um, it's our pleasure to have today a discussion session with Wayne Mirbel. He works in Western University in Canada. He's a philosopher of science with emphasis in philosophy of physics. Uh, many of you have read different papers of, of him, and I, I am sure he doesn't need any more presentation. So uh, thank you, Wayne, for accepting our invitation. And we are really glad to hear you talk about, a bit about your paper and then to discuss your view. Thank you very okay, much. Great. Well, great. Well, thanks for inviting me. And I just realized that's one of the, I don't know if you can sure you know, the sun is setting outside my window. And I suspect, so if, like if I, my half of my face gradually glares out, um, don't, don't worry too much about that. Um, yes, yeah, so um, this particular paper is um, part of what I think is going to be a trilogy. Um, so the, the first part, and then there's a sequel to it, which elaborates on a point made in this, which is called, um, it's got this horrible title, Subjectivists About Quantum Probabilities Should Be Realists About Quantum States, which is in um, a volume that um, just came out this year, another, another volume just came out year. And I sort of have projected a third volume, or a third paper where I'm going to talk in some more detail, in particular about um, certain people's views, including Richard Healy's views and Rob Speckin's views, if I can figure out what he thinks. Um, so, and kind of background for me to this is almost 20 years now of having conversations with Chris Fuchs and Rob Speckins and getting very frustrated because they insist that they, you know, the, the one thing that you know about what Chris th Fuchs thinks is he does not think that quantum states represent anything re in, in the real world. What he actually thinks the, what the world is like is harder to get from him. Um, he, you know, he's not a solipsist. He does believe that the, he is an agent interacting with the physical world, but he doesn't tell you anything at all about what that physical world is like. Um, and, yeah, um, so uh, having these discussions with these people who deny the reality of, of um, quantum, quantum states. And on the other hand, the fact is that anyone who's come up with an actual an account of what goes on in the, in the world such that we get the, the, the result, empirical results um, that we do from quantum mechanics, all those interpretations as like, you know, it's, we use the phrase interpretations of quantum mechanics, which is kind of misleading because that makes it sound like you've got some uninterpreted theory that you're adding inter interpretation to. But anyways, all, you know, all the major so-called, I mean, the, the most, you know, the, the main avenues of approach to um, interpretation of quantum mechanics all have quantum, um, you know, quantum states as real in, so, in some sense. And I remember um, Anthony Valentini raising the question many years ago, well, could you make a theorem out of that? You know, can, can you um, have, you know, make, um, yeah, is, is there a theorem to the effect that any really serious interpretation of quantum mechanics would have to have quantum states as part of the ontology? And I thought about it for a while and never got anything that I, I was satisfied with, and Anthony and some other people did. And then um, the PBR theorem came along, the PC Barrett Rudolph theorem, and I kind of went, oh yeah, that's that's really nice. That's sort of on the lines of what we were thinking about. And so the paper of uh, is is this yeah you, know, uh, you know, um, I wrote this for you know, this book, which largely has a philosophical audience, to make the um, that and related resu res results known to a philosophical audience and to explain the logic behind them. Because I think that people who hear about these theorems sometimes get the wrong impression and you'll see some expositions that are kind of misleading and they get the impression that they have assumptions about the character of the state's base or assumptions that amount to classicality assumptions and they don't. I mean, I think, you know, what I want to make it clear is that I think the assumptions that these um, uh, theorems are based on, um, or at least the modified version of the P PBR theorem that I uh, um, offer in the paper, are, the assumptions are pretty weak and are, are the sorts of things that are very deeply embedded in not only scientific reasoning about the world, but everyday reasoning about the world. 
know, the sort of thing where, you know, if I'm taking notes on a laptop, and I think that I or someone else will, will later be able to read it and look at the readout and gain information about what keystrokes I chose. Um, we tend to think that's because my choice of keystrokes is, is having a, an effect on the physical state of the machine. Even if you know nothing at all about what the physics of, of, of what goes on in a laptop is, the first thing that you would come up with is, okay, if I press blah, 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 and someone can, can tell the difference between me pressing that key sequence of, of keystrokes and possessing another one, that those keystrokes result in distinct physical states. That's the sort of assumption that, that is at um, the heart of these things. And that's actually where, you know, that's the point at which Chris Fuchs goes off, gets off, you know. Um, you know, he, um, I mean, I think he actually does believe that he has that sort of effect on a laptop, but his official view is he's not, uh, 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 is he's not allowed to say that. Um, so, um, so, you know, I'm not going to go into the details. You've had a chance to read it. I just want to make a couple um, methodological remarks. Um, one is I distinguish between um, reasons for taking a certain project to be pursuit worthy and reason to believe that something is true. So um, I think that if you talk to Rob Speckens or um, or some of these other people, and they tell you, and, and you know, you ask them, well, why do you think that um, quantum states don't represent anything in reality? A lot, they'll often talk about analogies between quantum states and classical probability distributions, and I think that those sort of analogies. Um, yeah, raise the question and, you know, can we have an interpretation of quantum mechanics according to which quantum states are just like classical probability distributions? And the answer is unequivocally no, we can't, right? And um, of course the, okay, I say unequivocally no, we can't. Um, the, the um, you know, these theorems um, rest on, um, on um, assumptions. You could of course, reject those assumptions if you had good reason to. So another methodological point that, um, that I, I wanna make about this paper is, you know, I say explicitly, I don't think it's reasonable to reject methods of inference simply because using them leads to conclusions that you don't like. I, you know, I, I, um, and another methodological principle, and this is why I had you know, found myself offering a um, slightly weaker version of the um, PBR theorem is, um, I think that if you're looking at a physical theory and trying to ask what's it's telling us about the world and drawing ontological conclusions from it, you need to be cautious because the theory that you're talking about is not a fundamental theory. No one has ever put for, forward a candidate for something that could possibly be a complete fundamental theory. We know that quantum mechanics is not. And, uh, and so if you're gonna draw ontological conclusions, they should be the sort of thing that um, you could reasonably expect to be robust under a transition to a successor theory. Um, and um, in the case of quantum mechanics, we know that it's not fundamental and we, we have a successor theory. Quantum field theory is, you know, the rel is relativistic version of, of it. And so I don't want any psi-ontic theorems that um, rest on assumptions that are satisfied in quantum mechanics and not in quantum field theory. And so that's why I was, um, you know, unhappy with one of the assumptions of the uh, PBR theorem, which is the um, Cartesian product assumption that if you, that, and the idea is, so that, you know, the basic assumption behind the PBR theorem is that it's possible somehow to prepare a pair of states in such a way, or sorry, prepare a system in such a way that their physical states are, um, are probabilistically independent. And they include in that uh, um, a Cartesian product assumption that when you do this, 
you can represent the states as just a, um, yeah, you know, like they're, you know, you're in some region of state space in, in, in which um, states of the, of the product system are just, uh, uh, of the composite system are just, um, consists of specification of state of one and state and the other one. You can approximate that in quantum field theory, but you can't completely satisfy it. You can never completely disentangle two space-like separated re regions. And so I wanted a, theor a, a theorem that depended on, on, a, on a weaker assumption um, um, than the Cartesian product uh, assumption. I came up with the thing that I called the preparation uninformative condition, which makes no assumptions whatsoever about the um, structure of the state space. Uh, we can talk about what that is exactly. Um, uh, um, the, um, just add a sort of a biographical footnote to this. Um, the um, paper where the, the, the results were, um, that follow from that assumption um, are, are presented, um, is cited in the paper, the paper of mine from um, um, in, in Physical Review A from 2018. That was actually, that actually started out as a section of this chapter and they just got too big and too, too technical and I said, okay, now I have to hive it off and have it be a separate paper, which I can get that in sight in this chapter. Um, so I had sort of, um, you know, and, and ended up having like a, you know, um, you know two papers instead of one. Um, that's all I want to say to get started. Um, if anyone has any comments or questions or Okay, let's, uh, let's move to the Q&A. So uh, please, if you have a question, just write it uh, on the chat and I'll keep track of the, of the list of people who want to, to ask things. Um, and then we says, do you want to go first? Or they can just raise the hand as well, right? Or yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll keep my eye on everybody. So uh, you want to go first? Uh... Sure. I mean, um, I mean, I had, a, I, I guess, I had a, like a, a bunch of questions, but let's I go one wondering... by one. So Federico is gonna have another question after yours. Okay. So I, I guess I will start with just some. Um, so just, I mean, I just, I was just trying to have some, some clarity on the paper, on the on the general structure okay. of the paper. Right. So it seems it seems that one of the things that um, you you have, I guess, I will say to. Um, a very general aim, which is just to argue for the realism of the quantum state. Mm -hmm. uh, so, there, so there's no commitment to any specific way of understanding what the quantum state, except that it's physically real. That's absolutely uh, right. Yeah. Right. So I, I guess so. I, I'm I, I'm thinking of your theory of, as a sort of um, of your approach here as a sort of a selective realist approach. So it's, it's not even a structural realism, but just scientific realism, and then there's just going to be some posits or some uh, parts of the of our representations that you think that uh, we should have we should be realistically committed to Is yeah that that's right? that's yeah that's absolutely right I didn't really um, uh, uh, um, go into the the issue more general issues of scientific realism and actually sort of have a you know sketch of a paper in mind that I'm going to write in which I, I explain what I think about science yeah I think that um, yeah, um, one ought to be some form of a selective realist. And um, my own view about that, and so, you know, there's various versions out there on the market, you know, there's, there's um, structural realism, um, et, et cetera. My own view is that there's not much you can say beyond you should believe in the things you have good evidence for, which is, which is a very, you know, I, I, I think an incredibly mundane proposal, but I don't think that it attempts to make sweeping claims like it's structure or it's this or, 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 or that really, um, re, um, um, really succeed. So um, I gave a, a talk at this at, um, at, um, at Rochester University. I was invited by Alyssa Ney and um, I, I, I made the, um, 
you know, I put a slide said my, my incredibly mundane proposal, you know, believe in things that you have good ev evidence for. And, and Alyssa pointed out it has a really great ac acronym that, 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 that Wayne's in incredibly mundane proposal has a really great ac acronym. So when I write the paper, this is gonna be wimpy realism. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. Um, yeah, and I want to say so. Something. So, yeah. So, um, yeah. The, the the conclusion of these theorems is basically that preparations that we associate distinct pure quantum states with yield different physical states of affairs. So it's nothing at all about what those physical states of affairs are. Um, right. Right. I mean, you, you, you right. Point and, out and, and 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 then of course you want to say more, right? And um, different approaches will, uh, so I think the quantum states play different role, different physical roles in um, collapse theories and in de Broglie bone pilot wave theories and many worlds theories and stuff like that. They're all real in all those theories. And by the way, um, I don't know whether Richard Healy agrees with this, but I think his pragmatist quantum realism is also a re quantum state realist uh, um, uh, um, theory and the way I'm using the, the, the terminology. I, I, Can I just have like, a, Maria, yeah. like a quick follow up, uh, just just on the, on, yes. the, on the same vein, but so at some point in, in your paper, you mentioned that you think that the, the person, so you distinguish two, two people, right? Uh, the anti-realist who you're not going to deal with uh, because that, that's like a Totally different discussion in a sense, right? Between mm -hmm. realist and anti-realist. Yeah. And then you and then you claim that you're going to be discussing with the one who accepts realism for other physical theories, classical theories, but not for the quantum state. Right. Yeah. And then you say uh, there are two sorts of arguments to consider. Those are arguments that that try to uh, make the quantum states disappear, and arguments that that deny uh, that there's like an ontological correlate for the quantum state. But then. I, I, I guess I wasn't exactly sure, uh, for example, how you took, uh, for example, the psi epistemic view uh, to be, what, which of those views you took it to be, and wh okay. whether the, yeah. so, sorry, and, and whether your discussion on, um, for example, on this last, on, on the last theorem that you discussed that um, quantum states should have an associated, uh, on a psionic interpretation, quantum, quantum states have an associated physical state. Uh, but you took that argument to, to establish against those two positions, the disappear position versus the no, no, no physical correlate position. Sorry if it's a bit long. I'm sorry, like, I'm not reading. Where, where do I disappear? I'm, I, I don't remember distinguishing between those kinds of positions, the disappear position and no physical correlate position. Uh, um, sorry. Um, Moises, uh, Moises, your your mic is off, so he. Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. What what I was saying is that there are. Um, it's in the in the beginning of part two. You say. Um, uh, let's look at let's let's take a look at some of the reasons that have been given for the name. The quantum states represent something physically yeah, real. Right. There are two ways one could take this. Motivating mm -hmm. a pursuit of a project trying to uh, develop a theory on host ontology, quantum states right. do not do not appear. Right. And another way will be to take them as arguments for the conclusion that quantum states do not represent anything physically real. Right. Yeah. Right. So. 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 Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah, so if you're taking them as motivating factors, that means okay, I'm I'm taking this as a project to try to develop a a um, a theory on which quantum states are like you know, like quite like classical probability distributions, and I think that that was a well motivated project, and and. The thing about if I take something as a motivating condition for a project, I'm not. I am not um, committed to that project coming out one way or another. Like one of the things you could find out is okay, this pursuit doesn't work, and I think that that's actually what we did find out. That 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 no, you, 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 uh, um, the the well motivated project of trying to construct a theory in which quantum states are not real hits a dead end. And um, the reason I say that is that like, like when you talk to people, some physicists who call themselves psi epistemists or stuff like that, you know, the sorts of things that they give that ought to be reasons to believe that the, like when you ask them, why do you believe the quantum state isn't real? 
you know, they'll come like, they'll, they'll say things like, here are these analogies between quantum states and quant probability distributions. Okay, well, if that's supposed to be a good reason to believe the quantum states are just like quantum probability distributions, you're wrong. It's a terrible reason. If, it, if it's supposed to be a good reason for um, pursuing a project to try to develop a theory on which they are, um, they're, they're, quantum states are just like classical probability distributions, then yeah, then, 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 then it is. So, I mean, here's a good analogy. So, um, you know, in the um, 1840s, Kelvin and Maxwell were pointing out analogies between um, the um, equations of electromagnetism and um, equations uh, um, governing the behavior of incompressible fluid. And those analogies motivate the project of trying to construe, um, uh, uh, trying to construe electromagnetic fields as disturbances in an incompressible fluid. And I, that was a completely well-motivated project. Um, it ended up having, and you know, by the end of the century, people were saying, "No, I don't think this works." Right? Um, right? But yeah. Now, if, so there's so the distinction is, and I think that part of the reason that it's worth making that distinction is, you know, people use this terminology of theory choice, and I think that's never, you know, my recommend to everyone, never ever write that phrase because it always conflates different kinds of choices you might make. You know, I might choose an, a um, theory to work on, right? Or you might give me a list of theories and say, which one of these do you think is most likely to be true? Those are two very different kinds of questions. And Kuhn, when he introduced this terminology of theory choice, gives you a list of criteria for theory choice, which conflates criteria relevant to, to those two very different kinds of questions. So reasons to think a certain theoretical framework is pursuit worthy, worth of working on, are, are not the same as reasons for believing a certain theory to be true or a certain kind of theory to be true. Um, yeah. So that's that's what that is, yeah. And so, um, you know, you know, there are people who who um, say I, I hold a psi epistemic view, but then you press them for details, and they don't actually have a psi epistemic theory. They they have a hope of someday constructing one. Yeah. So uh, thank you, thank you to the two of you, Federico, please. Yeah, my question is uh, to try to understand uh, what do you mean by realism? Um, in your argument, in the paper, uh, you use uh, the PBR theorem and theorems of the sort that rely heavily on the assumption of hidden variables. Nope. Oh, that's, no. that's my question. No, well, no. Okay. Yeah, so one of the reasons, um, yeah, right, right. Yeah. So but let, let me let me finish yeah, so, that yeah, question. So, so you perhaps what, one you, of the you reasons perhaps can, yeah. What's that? What perhaps you can what? answer the whole of it. Yeah. So my question was because I am interested in this. Right. Consider this paper about Ruth Ruth Kastner, who says something like taking Heisenberg's potential seriously. What will you okay. think about that? Is that realism about quantum states or not? What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, so if um, you, you take, you're realistic about quantum potentials, right? Um, I don't know exactly what um, Ruth me means by that, but if you say, um, sorry, sorry, Leo's being a, a pain in the butt. <laughs> Leo wants attention. Um, yeah, so um, if you say it's a matter of fact, so uh, that, you know, you know, a certain quantum system has a certain potential to do this if you if you do this experiment and, and you can affect what that potential is by what kind of preparation you do. I think that's a quantum state realist interpretation. Mm -hmm. So let me say about the thing about, about hidden variables. One, my, one of my motivation for writing this paper is that people say things just like what you said, that, that this PBR theorem relies on this framework which, which presumes hidden variables. 
And um, that's completely false. It assumes there is no assumption whatsoever about the structure of the physical state space. None whatsoever. Um, so for example, um, yeah, so it says, I assume that you've got what, whatever you think is out there in the physical world, the collection of possible physical states is your physical state space. So one possibility is a physical state space that has nothing but quantum states in it. So people think that the, if you if you use the the, the variable lambda, you're, you 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 suddenly you know in the hidden variable theory, they don't ha it doesn't have that magical effect. So you can have a fits perfectly well within the framework to have a um, state space which is purely quantum, nothing but quantum states, no hidden variables. It's compatible with the theory. Um, Healy in his contribution to this volume says why he doesn't think that the PBR theorem uh, um, applies uh, um, for, to his view. And he, he, sa he says something that's just simply false about the theorem. He <laughs> says it assumes somehow, somehow or another that the state space isn't gappy, right? that, that, there are, that there are variables that always have values. There is no such assumption whatsoever. So um, on Healy's view, certain, um, certain variables have values in certain circumstances. So on his view, um, you could say, yeah, the, um, my state space consists a list of all the uh, um, physical magnitude after attributions that are true. That's my state space. Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, the, the state space, that's, that's what a physical state is. It's just a list of all the, in a given situation of all the physical attribute, magnitude so, attributions. So let, let me see if I understand your point. You say that the lambdas could be probabilities. Whatever you think, okay. So you have, you should have <laughs> distributions. People, people are bothered by, people are bothered by using a lambda. Um, yeah, so here's- And no, no, I'm not bothered. I'm, I'm they, just asking what, uh, what's your interpretation. Yeah. Because so, the lambdas, you, you say that the lambdas could be uh, quantum states also. Of course, okay. yeah, yeah. So but, yeah, ba basically, I, I'm saying I'm assuming that yeah, take then, whatever then, it is, whatever you is according to your theory is what is physical. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a co, you know. But then, you know, but then let, let me that add a, a technical, What's that? a technical observation. Yeah, you assume the lambdas as point that could be anything real, but then you assume you consider them as a set and you uh, describe preparations as classical probability distributions on them. So what you, you define an object, which is P of lambda. And that object is some very uh, concrete mathematical object. It's a Kolmogorovian probability. Um, so uh, okay, okay. What, what what's your take on that? What, what do you what, think? What, what, okay, um, what restriction are you, do you mean when you say classical probability? Like what, well, what is, the, if you what read the book excluding? about, yeah, what, what I mean, is that if you go to the definition, you will find that there's a very concrete mathematical structure, uh, you know, no, no, well, uh, I'm, okay, I, I know about yeah. the, the, stru the, the structure of probability yeah. theory. What is it when you add that adjective classical probability? Um, that suggests that it's restrict it's restrictive. What are we excluding? Well, you could have uh, contextual probabilistic models. Like okay, okay, this is okay. This 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 is good. Um, yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So um, when you, when people talk about contextual probabilistic models, um, basically that has to do with. Um, but what do you mean by contextualist? So, like, because you, you know, it was Bell who introduced. Okay. Uh, I don't know. You know the book of Beltrametti Casinelli. I can see. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that that sort of stuff is not excluded. No, that's that is not excluded. Yeah. So, like, um, Bell. Um, yeah, Bell is the one who introduced this 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 terminology of contextual uh, um, 
uh, 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 theories. Um, and you know, the prime example was the de Broglie-Bohm theory. And the reason it's, it's contextual is that it doesn't assign to every um, quantum observable a definite that value that will be obtained independently of, of that, uh, independently of what experiment is done. Okay, so if, if 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 you say that contextualist models are excluded by this, if you mean by that, it's an assumption of this theorem that every uh, um, quantum observable gets assigned a definite value that is revealed upon an experiment. That is completely, utterly false. Mm -hmm. um, so on, you know, on, <clears throat> on the, um, so, let's go, so let's just take the, the paradigm example of a contextualist theory, the Broly Bohm theory. Um, the ontic state space consists, you know, an ontic state consists of- No, a, but I, I know that the, I know that the Bohm theory falls into the theorem. Yeah, just for everyone, so so you know what we're talking about. The quantum state consists of a. Um, I'm sorry. The quantum state consists of a um, quantum state and um, definite values for 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 par particle positions. Well, it doesn't. Should. It does. It doesn't. It doesn't assign definite values to things like spin or something, something like that. Um, so with a preparation, you'll have a probability distribution over what qu qu over quantum state and particle positions because that's the sort of things. Right? So take any theory that you would call contextualist. Provide that it works. Just ask, okay, what is, you know, what is physical according to this theory? And, um, you know, if it works, you'll have a probability distribution over those things that you regard as physical according to that theory associated with the preparation. I see. So, uh... The point would be that uh, the fact that you can include uh, quantum states as the lambdas, and and then so the preparations are just classical distributions on the on the lambdas, um, and that would include also any any possible realist uh, formulation. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, it, it's very weak. I mean, it's hard to say any possible realist interpretation because someone um, would. Um, uh, you might come, you know, someone might come along with something I never thought of, right? Um, yeah. But I just do want to be clear is that it is a very, we very weak um, assumption. So um, in, in our reading group here at Western, we had a discussion of this paper um, a couple of weeks ago when Carlo Rivelli was there. And um, I think, and uh, um, we agreed that his rel relative quantum mechanics counts as realist um, about quantum states. Quantum mm -hmm. states are rel so because quantum states are, things don't have quantum states except relative to other systems in his view. But you know, just take, okay, you're gonna do an experiment. So you have preparation, then you do something to the thing and then you do an experiment. So you've got your apparatus consists of the prep, the, the apparatus consisting of the preparation apparatus and the measure and, and the and the measurement apparatus is a quantum system, and you can talk, even on on um, Collier's Rivelli view about the quantum state of the of the system relative to that other system. So, mm -hmm. yes, yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you to the two of you. Now, Gerardo, please. Hi, Wayne. Um, Hi. So I was just going to mention that there is, um, uh, I have a paper with Elias and Sudarsky uh, mm -hmm. that is called um, On Superdeterministic Rejections of uh, Settings Independence. And in that paper, we have a discussion on, on this idea that somehow in the context of Bell's theorem, you have to make some assumption regarding the probability of the lambdas. So perhaps uh, you can go there, uh, Federico. And if you disagree with what we say there, uh, it would be interesting to know your opinion. But I think uh, Thanks. we uh, uh, tend to agree with what uh, Wayne is saying here. Uh, okay, so 
Uh, I have uh, some questions and uh, I will start by um, making... Let's, let's do the same that we did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, let's yeah. go one by one. <laughs> one by one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so so uh, first of all, I, I just wanted you to, to um, explain a little bit more about this idea, uh, this assumption of preparation uniformativeness condition, because it is the first time that I uh, well, I don't know if there's the first time, but but can you say something about what exactly it entails and what uh, what it doesn't? Yeah, so um, basically it was meant, I, I was looking for a weakening of the um, PBR preparation independence postulate that didn't require the, um, the, the um, Cartesian product assumption. Um, and you know, so the history of this a couple of years ago, we had a um, discussion at the reading group um, at, at Western where we were talking about the PBR paper, and I said, "Yeah, I'm pretty sure you could come up, you, you could come up with a version of the theory that doesn't re require this Cartesian problem or something." And then we actually sat down to write the paper. It took me a while to figure out what you know what something that I liked. So, so basically, the idea behind it's meant to capture the basic idea behind the PBR preparation independence assumption without the um, Cartesian product assumption. And the idea is that it should be possible to um, subject a pair of systems to independent um, preparations that screen off any correlations between them. Right? And, and you know, we make that assumption all the time in um, in, um, in, in physics. And if you think about it, it's, just, it's an interesting assumption because it's not required by any relativistic causality assumption because you know, those, two, those, those two preparation procedures always have common events in their past light cones that could be the source of correlations. And the idea is if, if you try hard enough, you can screen off those correlations. And it's basically the same assumption that um, behind the assumption of, um, you know, no conspiracies or what's you know, these days is called no super determinism. What in, I call settings independence, right? In, yeah, in yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. These days, people started call, started calling it statistically independence, which I think is is terrible because it demonstrably misleads people into thinking that the assumption is that space like correlated events can't be um, co correlated. And of course, that's not the thing. It's, it's the idea that if you try hard enough, you can screen off the correlations between things, right? Randomize so somehow or another, right? Um, so um, the, um, the um, preparation independence assumption in the PDR thing is, okay, it's possible to produce something that's literally a product state. So you know, a, 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 um, a, um, uh, uh, in that, in the, uh, you know, a, a mix, a, 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 um, you know, a product state or a mixture of, of product states. Um, and um, actually, you know, you need the correlations gone. Yeah, no correlations. Right. And so, um, so here's, so, so how do you capture that idea of where I'm screening off the correlations without assuming that the state space can be, you know, even part of it can be represented as Cartesian product of state of this and state of that. And so here's, here's what I come up with. So suppose I do a preparation. And um, suppose you've got a pair of preparations you can choose on each side, right? Um, the idea of the you know, um, preparation um, uninformative condition is um, that, all right, so it, suppose now I give you, I were to te tell you the complete state of the composite thing. Right. Um, no, no, wait, let me go, let's, uh, uh, I have to remember how this, how, 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 how this goes. Um, Yeah, give you the complete state of the composite thing, right? And you might want, and 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 you might want to, and then I might ask you, given given that, how good are you at guessing which the uh, which of the preparations uh, uh, were, were done? Right? 
Okay, so you, there'll be a certain best guess you can make given the complete, you know, yeah, yeah, G give, given the complete um, state of the composite system, there's certain guess, be, be, best guess you might know. Now I tell you which preparation was done on part of it, on part A. Does that help you improve your guess about, um, about what preparation was done on part B? If it does, then there's then that's suggesting that there's some kind of correlation between the state the, 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 the states that differs uh, depending on the uh, on the on the me measurements. So somehow, you know, uh, um, choice of, of measurement is relevant to what you would guess about the the other one. And the preparation on informative condition says no, you can't. So that's entailed by the PBR. P for, um, um, preparation independence postulate, but it's strictly weaker. Yeah. And then fortunately okay. I get a strictly weak, I get a strictly weak, weaker result from it. So, you know, yeah. yeah. Then, but but, but can, can you say then a little bit, uh, this is not another question, it's the same. So, so what would it take to deny this? What, what kind of theory do you, would it be to say that, that uh, you are violating the, the, the PUC? So the idea would be that, that that's a good question. Um, that's that's a, that's a question that I have asked Rob Speckens, and I do not. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that is a question that I pose to people who say who who tell me that's an unreasonable condition. I can't you know, like because I I mean I I, I can um, I can think of of of, of theories that re, that that violate the condition um, that that. that have things like um, action at a distance in them, right? right so, um, but um, yeah, so I think that's exactly the right question to people like Rob. So I, I gave a talk on this a couple of years ago at um, at, um, at the Perimeter Institute, and Speckens was there in the audience, and he was saying, "Okay, no, I reject that condition." And I said, "Well, what kind of physical theory would it be that re that rejects that condition?" That is the question that these people need to answer. You know, give us a candidate. Yeah. And there is a parallel between what happens with people denying in the context of Bell's theorem, the settings independence assumption, or people like mm -hmm. Toft who, who right. deny it. And then you ask, well, what kind of theory do you have in mind? And they have a toy model perhaps, right. Right. but not but a- Nothing a, serious, a yeah. Theory. Yeah. Yeah, so I can't think of a th serious theory um, in, in um, that respects relativistic causality and in which that condition is not satisfied. Um, you know, this is a lot, um, of course, that's a lot weaker than, say, than saying I know there could not be one. Yeah. I think it, I mean, I think of it as a very, very weak condition. Who's next? Okay. Uh, ready for another round, people? Yeah. Wait, says, do you want to go? To, if, if, you, oh. if not, I, I just have a naive question that I wanted to, to ask. Okay, yeah. Uh, so uh, I, I was wondering, it's about your realist position, like in very, very broadly, and and what what kind of role would the inferential procedures play for you? Because Something that you were saying at the beginning is that it's it's not clear, but it seems to be like a selective realist position. What is behind this this standpoint? And also, you mentioned that you uh, that you were very careful to see which are the inferential tools that you were using and and the methodological commitments that you may have towards them. And I was wondering if you have any any sort of realist commitment towards certain parts of the inferential procedures or inferential tools that enable us to construct this uh, quantum states, for instance, um, that are going to be privileged from other types of uh, inferential tools that we can use in, in quantum mechanics in general. Or to... okay, I, I'm not really sure I understand the question. Because um, uh, so... one of the, one of the um, main main problems for selective realists is that they either say that they are committed to, to the to the inferential rules that allow them to get like the best inferences or the best predictions of their theories, or they say that they are only instrumental, right? 
Right. So um, I, I was wondering if if you have any any distinction between the like the formal apparatuses that that physicists use, and if some of them can be privileged when when stating a radius position, or whether they are not. Or... Um. Yeah. So I mean, I do think th so. Yes. Question about formal apparatus. So. Um, okay. I mean, one thing that I think that, so in terms of quantum mechanics, the non-controversial formal apparatus is, part of the apparatus is you associate certain um, quantum states with certain preparation procedures, you know, certain unitary operators or certain manipulations and certain, you know, um, self-adjoint operators with experiments. And you can use those to get, get good predictions about probabilities for outcomes of experiments. Right? So I am assuming that that you accept that that, that all of that it work, works at least approximately, you know, within the domains that your, your discussion. Now that leaves it open: what exactly is going on in between the preparation and the experiment, um, and the sort of inferential procedures that I'm asking you to 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 um, accept in this case are actually the same sorts of things that. Um, you just bring to everyday life. So if I can, um, you know, you know, if 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 I can do something to a piece of paper, you know, make a choice of things that to, to do to a piece of paper, then hand it to Federico, and then Federico can look at the paper and tell tell you which choice of things I I did to to you, to the piece of paper. Then I think that we would all, you know. Um, all tend to assume that, yeah, you, um, what I did altered the physical state of the paper and Federico, when he looked at it, found something out about how I, how I altered the physical state of the paper. I don't know actually what we like to proceed without that kind of assumption. Yeah. And, and, you know, despite what they say, I do think that Chris Fuchs and, um, and, and, and Rudiger Schack do believe that when they're sitting in a lecture taking notes on a laptop that they are altering the physical state of the laptop and that they will when they look at it tomorrow learn how uh, you know, learn about what choices that they made right um in my sequel paper i said okay because there's a matter of fact that they are using a laptop and not a kumquat to do this right and i do think that they believe there's some physical difference between the laptop and a kumquat that makes one suitable for that and and the and the other that you know, uh, right. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question or not. If if it doesn't, then go ahead and ask the question again. No, no, no it 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 does answer. Thank you. Uh, now, my sister, are you ready? Sure. Um, so, it's difficult for me to choose between questions, but uh, so I guess I mean, in case we don't we don't run out of time. Um, I have a question which I wanted to ask more. So, uh, I mean, you may not be aware of this, but some of the stuff that you say in your paper actually resembles um, some stuff that Russell discusses, for example, in, in the analysis of matter. Um, I mean, in a very broad, uh, broad manner, but uh, for example, some of the of what you take to be essential inferences for the scientific method. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, for example, I, I, I take it one of the important claims that you make when you're discussing uh, the psionic view and some of the assumptions that need to go into uh, psionic models um, is that this distinguishability, distinguishability condition that whenever you're going to have a distinct, um, you know, a, a distinct outcome, outcomes for experiments, then those are going to be associated with. Uh, different quantum states and different physical states and so on. Mm -hmm. And then um, all, all of your discussion involving, for example, uh, local experiments, all of that, mm -hmm. it very much resembles uh, some of the stuff, for example, that Russell was trying to do in the analysis of matter, but uh, what he was trying to do is, what is not, not so much on quantum mechanics, but just, just the topology of the physical world, just the physical geometry. And some of the assumptions that he had were obviously that were, were very similar in the sense that different observations were going to correspond to different uh, physical structures, and that physical structures you could trace them back uh, through 
some sort of isomorphisms to, uh, to causal chains, beginning with physical objects. Um, and I guess, I mean, that's, that's just something which, uh, because it's something I'm, I'm working on right now, where, uh, and the Russell's response to, to Newman objections. It's, so it's, it just caught, caught my mind because, uh, it caught my eye because uh, obviously one of the things that um, someone who's working on a structural realism worries about is uh, that it seems very intuitive how to, it seems more intuitive how to try to give a structural account of the, of the spatial temporal world than to give an structural account of the quantum mechanical world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but th the way in which you do, you give an account of the quantum mechanical world is just in terms of uh, pro probability of uh, different, different experimental outcomes traced back to uh, probabilities associated with uh, each of the representations for, that we use for experiments. So uh, I guess, I guess my, my question here finally is, I'm sorry about that, is that um, it, seems, it seems possible to build on what you're doing. I mean, even though you're, you're saying that you're trying to develop a, a, wimpy, real, a wimpy sort of realism, uh, there's, I mean, there's no reason why one shouldn't, uh, why what, uh, why should we stop there in a sense. So, um, so one might think that uh, these these ways of describing what's going on with uh, observations in terms of uh, probability of associated probabilities for uh, quantum states sort of gives away for the for structural realists to try to describe their epistemology of uh, the, of the structure. Um, I mean, you you said you have suspicions of structural views before, but I guess I wanted to hear your comments on that. Yeah, so uh, thank you for this. I should probably go back and look at Russell. Um, I'm pretty sure that I read parts of the analysis of matter back when I was a grad student, but I'm also pretty sure that I don't really remember it. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm happy that there are things that uh, you know, what I, some of the things I say are reminiscent of some of the things that Russell says. And, you know, um, because a lot of what I was talking about, I thought were just things that very are deeply embedded in the way we interact with the world. I think that I, I would hope that you could find similar things in, in lots in lots of people. Um, so, um, yeah, so, um, I mean, I'm, um, I guess my reaction to structural realism is I'm basically more or less sympathetic to it, um, though I don't really know exactly how to characterize structure. Um, and um, I'm not convinced that being a proper realist requires you to, to say, okay, here's what we believe, you know, and it's, it's in structure and then you give a, a, an account of, of what the structure is. So, I mean, I, I definitely find myself very sympathetic to the sorts of things that the, um, advocates of, of structural realism say, and there's probably something in the neighborhood of that that's right. Right, but you, you wouldn't rule out the, that uh, some a priori incompatibility between your view and some structural accounts, right? I mean, there's... I, I I can't you know I would not rule out in I would not I would not say that my what, what I'm saying is incompatible with structuralist accounts I, I wouldn't want that no right because I mean in, in a sense they are part of the same church right I mean they are real it's also a realist account even though it's a very weak account uh, it's also sort of a realist account of the yeah. physical world yeah yeah so I, I I tend to be rather sympathetic with a lot of lots of things that structural realists say. Um, Gerardo, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, well, um, let me see which one. Uh, so, okay, uh, um, I think this is uh, an easy one, a quick one. So, um, would you say that the kind of, of assumptions that uh, people believe that are present in the PBR theorem are sometimes or different from the assumptions that people think that are present in Bell's theorem. I'm thinking about uh, a lot of the, the uh, ideas that I'm thinking about people saying that Bell's theorem doesn't 
go uh, doesn't uh, oblige to, to uh, the conclusion of non-locality because uh, it assumes things like classicality or other properties like that. Uh, do you think that there are uh, specific assumptions that appear in this context that do not appear in the context of Bell's theorem? Um, no, I do not. Well, uh, um, so um, so the base the basic framework, you know, is is is, is both both for thinking about Bell. To, I mean, I think that you know people um, started thinking about this ontological models framework in in the context of Bell's theorem, and the and the ba and the basic framework of Bell's theorem is. I mean, the, the, there's there's a, a similar thing. You assume you've got some kind of physical state space, right? and you use you, and you and you let lambda um, range over the physical states. And you know, I was taught by Avner Shimoni, and he emphasized that you know, lambda does not commit you to talking about hidden variables. So what one possibility is lambda just you know your 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 complete state is is the quantum state. And then, so you just assume that associated. So in both cases, you assume some kind of set of physical states. You associate with a preparation a probability distribution over physical states, and then you impose conditions on those probability distributions. So in Bell's theorem, the condition you um, you 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 impose is that uh, is the um, is the factor visibility assumption that that um, or, I mean, sorry, it's not a condition on 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 the um, probability distribution. So you got you know any any probability distribution you want over the physical states, and then you know the assumption you imp uh, impose is that is that um, correlations between outcomes at, at, at a distance are explicable in terms of the the, the state prepared. Um, so um, yeah, so. It's a similar kind of thing, and um, people um, who misunderstand Bell's theorem tend to say things like, "Well, there's a hidden variables assumption there, or there's a classicality assumption there, or, or, or something like that." And it's the same kind of misunderstanding that you get of the um, PBR theorem. I see. Uh, then it seems that it is something that has to do with the usage of uh, ontological models. People just, you know, yeah. misunderstand it could that, that, you know, using the variable lambda or using the phrase ontological model doesn't commit you to any particular type. It doesn't say, say anything about what it is that's physical. Yeah. Do, you, do you want to ask another question, Gerardo? Mm -hmm. Well, um, okay, uh, I can continue. So, okay, so so um, this is a very general question. Okay, yeah. so the, the the usual way to understand PBR is mm -hmm. that uh, it rules out the kind of theory that Einstein had in mind, which is something that you you point out uh, correctly. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Quantum uh, Einstein uh, believed that you it could be the case that quantum states were something analogous to, to uh, probability distribution. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be uh, completely ruled out. And I just wanted to know what exactly uh, do you think that your paper adds to this um, situation? Yeah, so my, my primary motivation in the paper was to help people understand what the theor theorems do mean and what assumptions they do and don't or depend on. Because the, as I said, some people, um, you know, you know, you know, um, um, you know, some people get the impression that there's you know, really strong assumptions about the nature of the state space classical or something like that. Um, and so, um, you know, so in, in um, in my exposition of the Barrett out at, at out paper, I don't think I'm adding anything at all. I'm just make I'm trying to make it available to the philosophical audience. In the case of the PBR theorem, um, um, what I'm adding is the the observation that you can get a sort of result, a similar result with with a weaker assumption. 
Right? So that's that. But 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 um, you know, I, I mean, I don't think I'm I'm really adding you you know, to to uh, besides that too 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 much. And so I mean, I think it it sh you know should be. So like when people say I'm an advocate of a psi epistemic interpretation, and then they talk about what that's supposed to mean, it sounds like what they mean is something like what Einstein wants. And then you say, well, no, you can't have that. Right? Then if that's what, then then what is it that you think? What kind of interpretation is it that you think that you you, you have if you think you've got a psi epistemic interpretation that's not that's not one of the ones ruled out? And um, so, I mean, I should, I mean, I like people like Rob Speckens say this, and I've spent some time talking to him, and I intend to spend more time talking to him. I know what he thinks isn't in the world. I have no idea what he thinks is in the world. Like, like you know, he, yeah, because he sometimes talks as if he thinks that, um, yeah, that, that project of fulfilling what Einstein wants. Can can be fulfilled. Um, so, yeah. So, my says we'll have another question. I mean, we're encouraging people to ask more questions, but I, I guess um, uh, Gerardo and uh, me are the most enthusiastic on this material. Um, so, I guess. Um, my question was on the psi epistemic stuff uh, again, uh, 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 as well. Sorry. So, uh, so I, I mean, I guess there's a clarificatory question uh, that I have, which is that um, when you describe the psi epistemic view, um, you say that really the 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 view that that um, the the anti-realist about the quantum state uh, uh, should take is the what you call the maximally ma maximally psi epistemic view, on which uh, indistinguishability of quantum states is going to be it's going to be explained by overlap in the probability distribution, and then you show by the theorem that there's not not going to be any such overlap. So I guess I I, I just wanted to know why uh, why the anti-realist need the stronger condition on the one hand, and on the other hand uh, I also wanted to know if like is, is every psi epistemic view should every psi epistemic view be committed to um, trying to understand updating in 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 this way such that they are going to be blocked by by this theory? Yeah. So um, I, I try to distance myself from the terminology of psi epistemic views, um, um, and the reason for that is that um, I mean, yeah. So. Um, Harrigan and Speckens define psiotic views as views that, that, uh, that, that, that say that um, preparations um, corresponding to distinct quant pure, pure states are, are ontologically distinct, right? And then they just simply define psi epistemic as the negation of psiotic. And I think that that's very misleading terminology. Um, the reason it's very misleading ter terminology is that, um, well, um, I mean, the analogy I give, you know, think about, you know, um, in, in, the, in the early days of quantum mechanics, people um, tended to talk in about uncertainty relations, in they tend to say, "Well, you can know the the, the position, but not the and not the momentum at the same time, right?" So you know, imagine I've got a classical theory with um, 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 uh, uh, suppose you know, suppose I've got a class a, cl a classical theory with epistemic restrictions on it. And so in theory, this says, okay, you can ask me what the position of this is, or you can ask me what the momentum it is, but you can't ask me both, right? Um, so um, preparation of a definite position and preparation of a, um, a, um, of a definite momentum 
clearly those two preparations classically have a lot of overlap, right? You know, a given momentum with, will be compatible with, with, with a, 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 a given position. Right? Okay. But, um, all right. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. So, preparation of position and 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 um, momentum; those won't be ontologically distinct. Right? There'll be overlap, but that doesn't mean that, uh, that that there's anything epistemic about position or momentum. So you can have, um, you know. Um, so I so and when you say psi epistemic, you know that suggests that you've got a theory in which um, in which the quantum states are just like classical probability distributions; they're states of knowledge. Right? And I do think that um, that um, if you have that view. Then um, you might you say, well, why on that view would two preparations not be distinguishable? And the only explanation on, on a view like that is overlap in probability distributions. So I do think that if you're if you have a view on which um, quantum states are just just like um, prob epistemic, in which quantum states are just epistemic probability distributions. I do think that that would be what you know um, people people call maximally psi epi epistemic. So I, I mean I think that um, Harrigan and Speck Speckens um, introduced terminology that made it sound like it's easier to get to that goal of having um, a, 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 um, quantum state be just epistemic than, than, than it in fact is. So, so I actually, I, I don't particularly like the, I'm happy with the terminology of psionic, but I, I think the way the term psi epistemic is used is just confusing. No, that helps. Yeah. Um, Gerardo, do you want to ask something else before we finish? Yes, not? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, this is the, uh, my last question, and it is um, okay. The, the so, Monty Hall question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, no, it is a little different, I think. So, um, okay, I, I'm taking a little advantage of the fact that you uh, have written uh, a lot about Bell's theorem. And I think that you are the current uh, author of the entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia, yep. right? Yep. Okay, so um, here's one way to think about the role of um, role of lambda in Bell's theorem that I think that is the correct way to think about it and that it can sometimes help to dissolve some of the confusions regarding classicality the, the, and probability. The, 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 the idea that somehow classical probabilities appear. Mm -hmm. And the thought goes something like this. Um, Rho of lambda, it's confusing to think about it about, uh, as a distribution of probability. First and foremost, it is uh, something akin to a histogram of an actual experiment that you are going to make. And the lambdas are just the, the physical state of the system that you are going to measure. You are not assuming nothing about it. Mm -hmm. And what you have is not a probability, you have a, a frequency. And uh, frequencies, we know how to deal with them. We don't have to invoke uh, any axioms or anything about it. And are things that are in the world and, and we know how to deal with them. And the idea is that you only need to, you, you can do everything that you can derive Bell's theorem with this understanding of what the uh, row of lambda is and not invoking at any point the idea that it somehow represents uh, probabilities. Uh, that those are uh, the, the actual uh, frequencies. Uh, it is, uh, yeah, and when you 
integrate what you have in reality is, is, is on something akin to a histogram of the actual experiments that you went and performed. Uh, yeah, so, I want to yeah, know what you think about it. Yeah, you can do that. Um, so um, if someone had some kind of objection to the idea that associated with a, pro a preparation um, is a probability distribution over, over the state, um, I don't know why one would have a, a, an objection to that, but if you did, you could say, yeah, well, then um, just, um, so let me think about this because I, I wanna make sure that it, Okay, I, I would be more worried about why they thought that that was that, that idea was prob problematic. Um, 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 but it is true that no matter what you think about what happens in a preparation, whether you think it makes sense to associate a probability distribution over the state, the matter of fact is that um, uh, um, the, um, I'm sorry. Um, if you do lots and lots of, of preparate, you know, if you do lots and lots of um, repetitions of the experiment, then you're going, and then you bin the the state space and build a his, his, histogram. So you you can you can you you um, you're going to have um, you know certain percentage of the initial states in this bin, and, and, et cetera, and the, and those will give rise to um, certain statistics about the outcomes, right? Um, and your theory, um, and your theory really should be able to account for um, the observed frequencies of, of, of experiments. Now, here's why I don't want to replace all probability talk with talk of frequencies. Um, I've got a book coming out on this um, called Beyond Chance and Credence in you know Feb January or February um, from Oxford University Press. Got a whole 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 half a chapter on why we shouldn't re try to replace probability talk with um, talk of frequencies is if you think about how this statistical analysis you know, what does quantum mechanics predict or what would a hidden variables so what would a lo a um, local a, a local theory um, pr predict well um, a local theory is of course capable of producing the um, a, 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 it is in fact capable of producing the observed statistics, which is a finite thing like that. And what we want to say, and what you do when you calculate, do your statistical analysis is you say, on any theory of this kind, this sort of result would be very improbable. And, um, and there you, you, you're invoking a notion of probability that is distinct from those fre fre frequencies, because you have to talk about the probability of a certain, a certain set of frequencies. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, quantum mechanics doesn't say if you do this experiment, you will get a violation of the Bell inequalities in the observed frequencies. It says, here's the probability that you will get a, a, a violation of Bell inequalities in the observed frequencies. And so I can, you know, and I can take a um, local model satisfying the, the um, factorizability condition and that model won't say you will see, won't have a prediction. You will see a satisfaction of the of the Bell inequalities. They'll say, "Here's the probability." Right? And what they people do when they do the statistical analysis of the experiment and, and com compute a p-value, like when um, um, you know, Marissa and her, her group did, is you know they said, "Okay, here's the class of theories that have that have." the factorizable probabilities and here's the highest probability in those class of theories that you can that, that you can um, attain within that class for, for the results we got. And it's very, very small. Okay, thank you. Well, maybe, maybe it's time to uh, finish this session. Thank you very much, Wayne. Uh, well, thank you for inviting me. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much nice for coming. Nice to meet you all. Thank you for all the questions. Maybe if we you, keep Wayne. this seminar alive, um, we can have you next year to discuss a part of your book. 
Otherwise, I, I, I love that. And I'd, I'd love to stay on your mailing list in, in, you know, for future, you know. Thank, thank you very much, a lot. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, everybody. See you Gracias soon. Gracias a todos. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.